Um, now, um, as usual, I invite questions, uh, especially ones that are written on the chat board so that I can actually read them um, and don't have to depend upon my ears and the uh, uncertain audio of our various systems. Um, I think if we don't have any questions, well, let me first mention that the homework, uh, the last homework assignment is on the class uh, website. As you may notice, you may have noticed, um, it involves some problems that, we, that are involved previous material because I thought it was good to um, have you uh, reflect upon complex variable theory, differential equations, bezel functions, and so forth. Um, and also some uh, one, one problem on uh, chapter 15 on uh, probability and statistics. But um, let me now switch to another application of the Gaussian uh, distribution, which is to diffusion. And uh, the idea here is you imagine a particle in a gas or a particle in a liquid. It gets uh, hit from before, uh, from fore and aft and from both sides by various, uh, various equations, equations. <sighs> by various molecules. And um, what happens is you get then a, uh, a uh, Gaussian distribution in the step size. And um, this uh, turns out to be, if you have n steps and dx is the um, step size, um, then uh, you get a distribution like this, e to the normalization, and then e to the minus x squared over twice the number of steps times the square of the step size. Um, and this uh, ratio is called the diffusion constant. And so the, in one dimension, the probability that the particle be at x in time t um, Let's see, where did I sneak time t in here? Well, I guess I just stuck it in like that. Anyway, um, it, uh, this is the diffusion constant then, and in three dimensions, it looks like this. Um, this is the equation that we used back in, I guess, chapter four or so. Um, if you then compute the mean value of the square of the position, which is the variance of the position, it turns out to be three sigma squared. And that's, of course, an integral of R squared, the probability distribution. You wind up with an answer that's six T, six D times T. And so this is the diffusion constant. Notice, therefore, that the square of the, the mean value of the square of the position, it starts out at the origin, uh, increases linearly with the time. So in other words, the distance increases as the square root of time. So that's how, for example, um, cream diffuses in coffee or milk in tea. Um, the distribution uh, satisfies then the diffusion equation, which is P dot is diffusion constant times the grad squared on P. Now, um, the let's, let's make this bigger so people can see. Uh, the first theory of, um, this is called Brownian motion, by the way, and the first theory of Brownian motion was Einstein's back in 1905, but uh, Langevin's three years later is simpler. 
Um, so let's imagine that there's a tiny particle of colloidal size. In other words, it's size of a molecule or somewhat bigger. Uh, mass M in a fluid buffeted by a force and the force is due to the 10 to the 21st collisions per second uh, that it uh, suffers with molecules of the surrounding fluid. So um, that's something to, something that's quite striking. Damn it, I didn't want to do that. Something that's quite striking about biophysics is that, and in fact about physics of the small scale in general, is that the numbers often turn out, even though the scale is small, the numbers turn out to be much bigger than one would think. And so you have here 10 to the 21 collisions per second, just in an ordinary uh, glass of water. Um, and this happens in cells and this is um, in, in bacteria. In fact, bacteria depend upon diffusion uh, for, the uh, the translation or the transportation of all the molecules that they need. They're small enough to depend upon simple diffusion. When you get to larger animals, um, then uh, for example, just um, eukaryotic cells uh, have built in, they construct internal transportation systems that are kind of like railroads uh, that bring needed molecules from one end of a cell to the other, from the center of the cell to the edge, uh, the surface. Um, and in particular, in actual animals, the cells uh, uh, have such systems. Anyway, um, Oh, hold on. Yeah, the, the question in the chat board was, is this the last homework assignment? I think so. Um, I'm terrible about planning. I never plan anything unless I'm forced to. And then usually it's so late in the game that I only have one choice left and I take it or leave it. Um, I think this will be the last, there's no exam. I think this will be the last assignment, but when I um, check and find out when the grades are due uh, and so on and so forth, when the exam that we're not having is actually scheduled, I might sneak in an extra problem or two. Um, um, so this is probably the last assignment, but. I don't want to guarantee it at this stage because I haven't checked these details. I'm sorry, it's a personal fault. I just, um, I don't pay much attention to the future because it's so unknowable. And I think I go too far in that direction, yes. Well, I'm sorry, but I'll try to straighten it out in a few days. Um, in any event, it's not going to be a whole new assignment with five problems. That, that I'll promise you. Um, so what did Langevin say? He said, well, let's imagine you have a tiny particle uh, in a fluid, and it's, it's hit 10 to the 21 times per second by water molecules and other molecules in the fluid. And so the mass of the, of the particle times the acceleration of the particle is of course given by this force. And so he said, well, this force is going to be a drag, a viscous drag, and then a rapidly fluctuating point. And so our equation is M A equals drag plus what's left, the um, rapidly fluctuating part. And, um, This parameter B is called the mobility. And um, it's kind of a strange name. I would call it the 
Yeah, I guess it is the mobility because um, no, yeah, because if the if you put the nobility, make the nobility uh, the nobility the mobility very small, then the drag becomes huge. The ensemble average. Um, by the way, one of the things Roy Glauber stressed so many times to me years ago was the distinction between the ensemble average, where at a given time you average over all the particles in your system, and the time average, where you look at a particular particle and average it over time. These are not obvious. These are obviously not the same thing. Um, the ensemble average of the fluctuating force is zero. That's um, uh, pretty clear, I think. Um, the ensemble average of the velocity uh, therefore satisfies uh, this equation in which this rapidly fluctuating force dropped out because it's, it averages to zero. Um, you can then solve that and uh, you have then a, a, um, a time tall, which is the mass times the mobility. And um, so now if you go back to this equation um, and divide by the mass, what you have is um, the acceleration is the velocity over tor. So we haven't done very much. We just divided by m uh, plus the rapidly fluctuating acceleration f over m. So once again, we're just pussyfooting around. Um, now, if we take now, the, here's where Langevin's intelligence comes to bear. Um, the ensemble average of the scalar product of the position vector with this equation then gives you this. On the other hand, this is the ensemble average of R with a random rapidly fluctuating acceleration. So this term vanishes. So we just have this. Now, uh, the time derivative of the dot product of R with itself is R times the velocity, dotted into the velocity. And so uh, the second derivative of R squared is, um, which is itself uh, R dot dv dt. Um, this is, uh, I'm sorry, it is this plus v squared. Um, and I mean, if you want me to do that in detail, let me just say we have, oops, hold on. What is going on here? Oh, God, normally this pen is so sensitive that there's no issue writing. What? Or I've had so many troubles today, this afternoon, with um, with quick time and with this iPad. Um, Boy, I don't know what's going on here. Um, if anybody has a good idea, tell me what to do. Um, all right, well, I'll let you just differentiate this. Um, and if you take the ensemble average of this equation, of course, what you get is just this. But now we already know something about this. Namely, we go back to this equation and we see that this can be replaced by that right-hand side. So we have this. And now we can also use this equation to write this in this form. But now this V squared is something we know about from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This is just the 
velocity of uh, particles and uh, it's 3 kT over M, M being the mass of a colloidal particle and the temperature being T. And so we have this expression here. Now this is something we can integrate. This is a second order ordinary differential equation for the average value of the square of the position, ve the position vector. And um, what we do is we find a particular inhomogeneous uh, solution, namely R squared being six kT T tau over M, put that in there, um, this term vanishes. This term then exactly gives you that. So that's a particular solution to the inhomogeneous equation. So the general solution to the homogeneous, uh, to the inhomogeneous equation is the general solution to the homogeneous equation, which is these two terms, plus this particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation. And now we make U and V fit the boundary conditions. And in particular, if the particles start out at the origin, then R of zero is zero. Um, and so one boundary condition is this. And uh, going back into this uh, equation here, we see then that we would have um, U plus W equal to zero. Um, they also start out with an isotropic distribution of initial velocities. So the time derivative here is um, uh, using 1.44, it's R of zero dot V of zero. And that should also have a time derivative, that should also be zero. Um, so what we've got then is that the boundary condition is this, and um, we eventually find that the, uh, the average value square of the position or the square of the average, no, the average value of the square of the position is then given by this expression. So it increases linearly with T as in the simple case of diffusion. Then uh, there's a damping uh, factor or and there's a damping factor. And then there's, there's this minus one. And so at time short compared to tor, what we have is for very short times, our, ex our naive expectation that R squared should go as T squared is true, but at long times, R squared goes as T, which is the uh, like in the diffusion equation. So um, what um, Einstein did when he worked this out in his terms is three years before Langevin, is um, he knew that the diffusion constant was always defined this way. He computed it in terms of K and T this way. And so uh, he derived the relation that the diffusion constant was the mo, sorry about that. The diffusion constant was the, was the mobility times Boltzmann's constant times the time. Boltzmann's constant wasn't known at this time, but people knew what the diffusion constant was because they had been drinking tea with milk and um, coffee with cream for decades. And so, and in their laboratories, they had measured the diffusion constant for various um, in ver for various colloidal particles in various uh, solutions, typically liquids, but also gases. And um, they had determined that the uh, viscous, uh, they had written the diffusion constant in terms of the viscous friction coefficient, Fv, which is one over the mobility, and this is m over tor, and they had had it, uh, or if you combine that with Einstein's equation, you then get FVD is KT. And of course they had thermometers, so they knew what T was. So um, the key point here is that Einstein's work expressed Boltzmann's constant in terms of 
three quantities, uh, V, D, and T, that were accessible to measurement in the first decade of the 20th century. I don't know why I had, um, I'm, I'm a little puzzled as to why I had V there. Um, let me make a note to myself. Um, Anyway, this enabled scientists to measure uh, Boltzmann's constant for the first time. So uh, previously, um, in other words, when Boltzmann introduced his, uh, or did his great work, um, he just had a constant K and um, he didn't know what it was. I guess he could estimate it, but um, didn't really know what it was. And um, people, didn't um, didn't really follow him. Well, I, I'm not an historian, so I don't know. But my suspicion, in view of the fact that he committed suicide, is that people probably didn't pay much attention to what he was doing, and didn't know what K was, and so thought it was all maybe kind of silly. Um, but. Um, if only he had lived longer, Einstein would have straightened things out and people would have realized what K was. And um, one uh, implication, a huge implication of Einstein's and Boltzmann's work is that then you see Avogadro's number was known, uh, what was known to be the gas constant divided by K, but nobody knew what K was. So nobody knew what the Avogadro's number was. It's of course the number of molecules in a mole of um, substance, which is uh, the gram molecular weight in grams of the substance. And, um, but once they knew what K was then they knew what Avogadro's number was, and then they could divide the mass of a mole of any pure system, substance by Avogadro's number and find the mass of the molecules that composed it. And when they did that, they found that the chemists were actually right when they were saying that various molecules, um, for example, CO2 was one atom of carbon, two atoms of oxygen. And so the mass of a CO2 molecule should be 12 plus two times 16 and, um, and so forth. And um, typically they dealt with solids. And um, so all of a sudden the masses of chemistry became known, molecules were recognized as real particles and not just as things for uh, balancing chemical equations. This reminds me a little bit of the situation when I first came to the University of New Mexico, many of the faculty here didn't believe, didn't know whether quarks existed or not, didn't believe the reports from uh, Slack and um, many other places that CERN that um, quarks were real. And, um, but eventually the truth came to be known. Um, so now the, let's now do a, uh, an extension of Langevin's work due to uh, Nernst. Um, and this is the case where you have a particle of mass M, electric charge Q exposed to a, an electric field E. So in addition to the viscosity and the random buffeting, you have a force QE on it. And um, so the mean va value of the velocity satisfies this differential equation. This is a particular in a solution of the inhomogeneous equation. You then um, find the average value of V is given by this and eventually then R minus R of T or the variance is given by this and um, we then it all boils down then to this Einstein-Nance relation. Now the diffusion constant is um, 
Q times the, the charge times the mobility um, divided by the charge times KT, or it's KTB, um, sort of as before. Um, one, what's also interesting though is, is this expression here that the, how, how does the particle go? Well, it's Q tor squared E over M times T over tor minus one, and then this uh, term here. Um, I should say that this is actually quite relevant today because um, we're dealing with coronavirus. And um, here then what you want would be the mass of the coronavirus. And um, instead of charge, you'd have I guess what you'd have is the mass of the coronavirus times the local acceleration of gravity, you know, 9.8 meters per second per second. Um, or, well, you got to put E here would be minus Z direction. But what you'd find here, I think, is that um, the time that it would take a coronavirus particle to fall to zero at atmospheric pressure would be um, a matter of hours. And that's why it's an airborne pandemic. So somebody coughs, or sneezes, or just breathes, uh, virus particles come out and it takes some while before they actually fall to the ground because they're hit 10 to the 21 times per second by air molecules. Well, it may not be 10 to the 21 per second for particles in the air, that's the liquid number. Um, so we can go again, we can look back at Langevin's uh, equation here and um, if we multiply both sides by this exponential integrate, we get this expression. And if we now dot it into itself and take the ensemble average, um, uh, we can set some things equal to zero and we wind up with this expression here. Um, this is the average value, the ensemble average of the acceleration at two different times. This is something called an autocorrelation function. And um, the, average, the average value of the square of the velocity then is related to the average value of the square times zero plus this exponential times this integral of the autocorrelation function. And it turns out that autocorrelation functions have various simple properties um, that are worth noting. Um, uh, if the system, sorry for this um, hiccups, uh, if the system is independent of time, then its autocorrelation function for any given variable depends only on the time delay. So the ensemble average of A of T, A is just any arbitrary thing. Dotted A of T, T plus S is just a C of S. The autocorrelation of C for S equals zero is necessarily non-negative. If the system is time independent, then uh, this is C of zero and it's uh, positive. The absolute value of C of T1, T2 is never greater than the average value of C at any given time. Um, and so we get this uh, inequality. If the variables commute, so here we're allowing for quantum mechanics, if the variables commute, then the autocorrelation function is symmetric. Um, and this for all classic things is symmetric. Um, if it's uh, randomly fluctuating with zero mean, then we expect um, that its ensemble average vanishes and that there's some character time scale by, uh, beyond which the autocorrelation function falls to zero. And um, if we go back to this variance of the velocity, which was this, since this is big only for short times, uh, when changes variables to S and W, 
the element of area, um, you can write in terms of forms this way, or you can just plot along with elementary calculus. And um, you then find, you just do the integrals and you get this expression here. Uh, but the autocorrelation function vanishes outside a small window. So we can approximate these uh, integrals as just the integral over the whole real line. And what you then get is this expression here. And um, so there you see there's an exponential decrease plus uh, another exponential decrease. And as t goes to infinity, uh, v squared approaches its um, equilibrium value. And um, so that must be given by this expression here. And so we get a formula for C and having worked all through all that, we get this expression here, an exponential decrease of terminal value and we approach that exponentially. And um, we can get back and find the uh, viscous friction coefficient is one over B it's equal to C. C is um, given by this expression here and equivalently by this. And so uh, the viscous friction coefficient is related to the integral of the autocorrelation function of the random acceleration or the random force. And this, so this is an equation that relates the dissipation of viscous friction to random fluctuations. And this is said to be a fluctuation dissipation theorem. Now, if we make use of the average value of V squared, put it in the formula for the average value of R squared, then we get this expression. If we said R squared of zero to zero and the time derivative equal to zero, we then get this expression, um, which is uh, basically the uh, last answer for this uh, section. Um, let's see, I don't know um, whether we should go, let me, let me just see what the other topics are that we could do today. Um, also, I don't see anything else in the chat box. Um, Yeah, I think I'm going to skip Fokker Planck. It's a little technical. You can read it on your own. Um, let me instead jump to some definitions here that are more important. The, it's something we alluded to earlier in the course. The Fourier transform of probability distribution is its characteristic function, sometimes written as chi of k. So you can think of it as the the, the characteristic function, which is the Fourier transform of the probability distribution, is also the average value of the Fourier phase. And then you can invert this by saying that the uh, probability distribution is the inverse Fourier transform of the um, characteristic function. Um, Uh, an example is, of course, the Gaussian uh, function. Well, that's going to have a uh, Fourier transform that's also a Gaussian, although um, the mean comes in so that it's, it's a sort of a shifted Gaussian. Um, for discrete probability distribution, the characteristic function looks like this. Um, the characteristic function of the binomial distribution is, well, it's given by this expression here. Um, the Poisson distribution has this characteristic function. Now the moment generating function is the characteristic function evaluated at an imaginary argument. 
So the moment generating function is the characteristic function of minus i k. And so m of k, and that's the average value of e to the kx, well, it's obviously the characteristic function that um, where you uh, use instead of um, k, you use minus i k. All right. Uh, so the, the, the utility of course of the moment generating function is that the nth derivative of the moment generating function is the nth moment, which is the average value of x to the n in the probability distribution. Um, three of these moment generating functions um, are uh, the binomial one is this, the Poisson one is that, and the Gaussian one is this, and the first three moments then are these. And um, these have derivatives that are uh, proportional to the moments. So um, the characteristic function then is a sum like this, and these are all the moments here. And the moment generating function is the average value of e to the kx, and so that gives us a sum k to the n over n factorial um, average value of x to the n, and that's mu sub n. The cumulants are derivatives of logs of the moment generating function. And the first five cumulants of an arbitrary probability distribution are zero, the mean, the variance, um, and then some, uh, the third central moment and the fourth central moment minus three, three times the variance. Um, the third and fourth cumulants are the skewness and the kurtosis. Um, why the person who came up with the name kurtosis ought to be um, fined. Uh, where skewness is a plausible name. Gaussian cumulants, um, well, I, I can skip that for a moment. I mentioned earlier that um, financial distributions have uh, fat tails. Um, and uh, this is why um, some outstanding investors um, are favor the buy and hold approach to the stock market. Um, because they say, well, time it. nobody can time the market, and at least they admit they cannot time the market. Um, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are two of the people who claim that they cannot time the market. And, um, anyway, I certainly don't think I can time the market. Anyhow, the Gaussian probability distribution falls off very rapidly exponentially, but others have fat tails. And so you can have wild fluctuation, market bubbles, crashes. These occur uh, and are in the fat tails. Um, and uh, such things are sometimes called black swan events um, because uh, you know, people who live in, the Northern Hemisphere in most countries have seen zillions of white swans and assumed all swans were white. And then when a black swan appeared, they were all surprised. Gossett's distribution, which is also called student's distribution or student's T distribution is this. It has power law tails, which of course are, um, are um, fatter than exponential tails. And uh, for nu equals one, it's a, a bright Wigner or Cauchy distribution. So again, this is not, this is much slower than a Gaussian. Um, some uh, cumulative probabilities are, um, are these two, um, which uh, I mentioned in a book by, um, 
Jean by Bouchot, Bouchot and Potter's, uh, this is a financial text, um, turns out that uh, the student's distribution wasn't written by a student, it was written by William Gossett, who worked for Guinness and Guinness wouldn't let its employees publish anything under their own names. So he submitted it to the journal under the name student. It's ever since been known as student's distribution. And um, I am trying to give the man credit by calling it Gossett's distribution. There's a log normal distribution, which is also, also has a fat tail. The exponential distribution is as a fat tail compared to the Gaussian distribution. And then there's um, a chi-squared distribution. Well, that's almost Gaussian. And um, oh, there are all sorts of other distributions. Now, something that's really important and not impossible to understand. In fact, the proof is rather direct. So I think we should go through it step by step. And this is called the central limit theorem. And um, it's associated with the name of Jarl Lindbergh. And um, what we imagine here is that um, we have n independent random variables described by n probability distributions and the only thing we require these probability distributions to have is to have finite means. In other words, the average value of X is finite. So they can have fat tails, but we want the average value of X to be um, finite and the average value of X squared to be finite. So basically, um, I don't know what, mathematical term one has for saying that, in other words, x squared p of x integrated minus one plus infinity is finite. I think that automatically means that x is finite when integrated. The pj's though can all be different. So you can have n completely different distributions. And the central limit theorem says that as you let the number of distribution go to infinity, the probability distribution for the average of the X's tends to a Gaussian quite independently about of what the underlying probability distributions happen to be. So um, this I think is one of the most surprising theorems of mathematics. And um, it's, uh, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, and very important. And it explains then why it is that we think of the Gaussian distribution or the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution as being the normal distribution. And it's that after all, if you are looking at the distribution of molecules, um, you might imagine what's the probability, what's the distribution of molecules? Well, you might assign a probability distribution for each molecule. And if it's in a box, then the average value of the position and the average value of the square are both gonna be finite. And um, uh, what does this say? Well, this says that the average value of the average position is Gaussian. And um, so that's essentially what we mean by a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Anyhow, uh, let's, let's go through the proof. The average value, uh, Y, by the way, is, is the average of all the X's. So there might be two, there might be 100, there might be Avogadro's number of X's. Um, so the average value of Y um, is, by definition, the average value of each, uh, the sum of the average value of each of the X's uh, divided by n. So it's the sum of the means divided by n. We also mean, we're also saying that the random variables are independent. And so that means that the joint probability distribution factorizes. That is to say, the 
these these uh, n random variables are uh, given by independent probability distributions. There's no correlation between one and the other. And um, of course, this is what we expect from molecules in a fluid or gas. And um, we had a rule for the variance of a linear combination of independent variables. Well, it's the sum of the squares of the variances. And the conditional probability distribution, that is to say probability of y given all the x's, well, this is just a delta function. This is that y is the sum of the x's divided by n. So now if we go back to this equation, um, which is saying that the probability of y is an integral of all the probabilities of the x's and then times the probability of y given x, then that thing is just a delta function. And so if we let dnx, dnx is this, so the characteristic function then is, well, the characteristic function itself by definition is the Fourier transform of Pn and Y. And, um, and we just saw that Pn Y is itself an integral of uh, delta of Y uh, times the probability of dnx dy. So we're just taking this thing and sticking it in there and we get this. But now, the, whenever you see a delta function, um, some people get nervous when they see delta functions. The um, a graduate student who's had this course, I hope, becomes happy when seeing a delta function because it makes the thing much, much simpler. It, it then says, well, this y is just equal to that. And so, the dy integration is instantaneous and the whole thing simplifies to this. But now the, by assumption, P is, a, uh, is given by the product of the P's because the random variables are uncorrelated. And um, so now we, we can factorize this integral. It's an integral over dx1 times P of x1 e to the i k over n x1. And that's just the characteristic function of uh, the first characteristic function of k over n, second characteristic went to k over n, and so forth. So, and pj is just e to the i, whoops. pj is just e to the i k uh, xj over n, so k over n times pj of x integrated. And now um, the Taylor series for each characteristic function, this thing here, well, it's going to be a sum i k to the n over n factorial, big N raised to the nth power mu n j, where j means the jth distribution, mu n means the nth uh, central moment. No, the nth moment. Um, so uh, for large n, we can approximate this, we drop n cubed. And then we say, well, we know that the second moment is the variance plus the square of the mean. And so we can rewrite this. Uh, like this, in other words, we substitute for uh, the second moment, this expression. And then, so for large n, what we've got is that this can be approximated by the first uh, two terms of this exponential. Actually, it's not even the first two. Yeah, it is sort of the first one and a half terms of that exponential. And so that's our expression for PJ, but um, we've seen that the Fourier transform is the, prob the 
whole probability distribution is the product of the Fourier transform. So that's the product of these exponentials. That's the exponential of the sum. And if you sum these, um, what do you get? Well, you get uh, the sum of the mu j's is uh, divided by n is just mu sub y. And the sum of the sigma j's over n squared is just sigma y squared. And um, so introducing the average value or mean of the average value and the variance or the standard deviation squared of the average value, y, uh, and we have these formulas for them um, up here, uh, we see that the probability distribution is of course this, and now substituting for PN, what we get is we put in this, and now these are just, this is just a Gaussian integral and it gives us a Gaussian integral. So what is the Gaussian distribution then? The Gaussian distribution is one in which the mean is the mean of Y. Y fluctuates around it in a Gaussian way and um, we have sigma squared of y there, sigma y squared of 2 pi. Um, the reason I write this in a backwards way is that if I wrote it square root of 2 pi sigma y, people would worry, is the sigma inside the square root or not? And uh, I suppose what I should do is use the square root that has the down slash here and put the sigma over there. Anyway, what this tells us is that the limit of the probability distribution for the average of all the positions is then a Gaussian. And um, when all the means and variances are the same, um, we just get, uh, in terms of this variable, we just get a normal distribution. Um, so to, as, to remind ourselves what the conditions for this working was, uh, were, um, we write the sum of the n variances this way, and the part of the sum due to regions within delta of the means as this, and in these terms, uh, Lindeberg showed that the exact distribution converges in probability to the Gaussian as long as this part is most of this in this sense. Well, I don't think we need to get that serious there. Let, uh, let me now show you several examples that I worked out, which um, I found amazing. Um, so the simplest probability distribution of a, is a random number uniformly distributed on the interval zero to one. And the probability P2 of Y of the mean of two such random numbers is just, is just this. It's an integral dx. So this is the average value. And this is just saying Y is the average value. And we just integrate that from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 because those are the distributions. The probability distribution that's random is P of X equal to 1 on the interval 0 to 1. And so here I computed it. This is the, uh, what we can do of course is, is uh, actually compute this analytically. So we just do this integral. If we do the integral setting u1 equal to x1 over two, we get that p2 looks like this. And that is given then by this sort of a theta function. And this is the dot dash triangle. So for P2, remember the central limit theorem holds the limit n goes to infinity. Here I'm setting n equal to two. And so the initial distribution was uniform on zero to one. The P equal to two distribution looks like this. Uh, what's the ne next? P equals four is the dash distribution and it already is starting to look like a Gaussian. P equals eight is the solid distribution. 
And in fact, the solid distribution is really, of course, very close to an actual Gaussian. But um, in order to do more complicated examples, we're going to have to learn a little more about random numbers. And um, so let's see, I don't know if I really want to go through this in detail. Um, I think I think maybe I made I made this too complicated. Um, okay, so let's let's suppose we have a probability distribution three r squared. So here we have the turn of distribution of all right. So, so this is just an example of how to deal with one random number problem. So if you want to turn a distribution of random numbers that's uniform on zero one into, the into a distribution of this form of random numbers R, so it's no longer uniform, what you do is you integrate P of R and you get X cubed. Then you set R equal to F inverse of U. And that's U to the one third. Um, so I think I should have said um, equals u if we want to do if we have an initial probability distribution 12 r minus a half squared and um, not, if we want to make such a distribution from a uniform, you see computers give you normally random numbers that are uniformly distributed. And there are various ways of getting them and depending on which computer language you're using, which computer system you're using and they vary. Um, um, so, um, what do we do? Well, we integrate the random number distribution up to X. We get this, we set U equal to that. And then we solve R uh, for, uh, is equal to this in terms of U. And um, that gives us the probability distribution, that gives us the probability distribution uh, in this form. So let's, let's, I guess uh, maybe I'm making this, going through this too fast. Um, suppose we take um, the probability distribution should be the same and they're all equal to three X squared on the interval zero to one and uh, zero elsewhere. And our random number generator gives us random numbers that are uniformly distributed on zero one. And so what we do is we see that the random variable R equal to U to the one third is distributed as PJ of X equals three X squared. And um, so then the central limit theorem will say that these various probability that the average value of all these variables um, uh, is given by the probability distribution of n of these variables given by this integral. This is the mean. If you let n go to infinity, you should go, it should become Gaussian. Here, mu of y for each j is this integral, which is three quarters. The variance is three over eighty, and um, the variance of the mean is then three over eighty n. And as n increases, this tends to a Gaussian uh, with the mean. 3 over 4 and ever narrow peaks because sigma squared goes to 0. So for n equals 1, we just have 3y squared. For n equals 2, 
we get this expression. And here's what, what happens as um, we, we continue to do this. So in other words, these probability, the first probability distribution is just 3x squared. So that's, that's this. But then if we have two distributions, both 3x squared, we then get this curve. If we have four of them, we get this curve. Eight of them, we get a, this solid curve. And you see, this is almost a Gaussian. It's not a Gaussian at zero, it's a Gaussian at the average value of y, which is three quarters. So that's um, basically how that works. Um, here was something more complicated, um, namely um, these probability distributions for the average. Uh, if each individual distribution is 12 X to the minus a half squared. So the initial distribution is just a Gaussian. I'm sorry, it's not a Gaussian at all. What am I saying? The initial distribution is quadratic. It's the opposite of a Gaussian. So the minimum at, at y equals a half, the probability is exactly zero. And um, the probability increases the farther one gets from y. And so for n equals one, we have this curve. But for n equals two, we have the dot dash curve, which is kind of weird, a bump. Then it goes up and down, and then another bump. For n equals four, we have the dashed curve. For n and and for n equals thirty-two, ah, almost a perfect Gaussian. So here we've got something that's like an, a quadratic, a parabola, sort of an anti-Gaussian. It turns into a Gaussian. Uh, when, when you have, let's say, 32 of them. We haven't had a question um, except for one about the homework. Um, does somebody want to type something into this chat thing and give me a little guidance? Um, All right, I'm going to then try to do a couple of things um, here. Um, so the exact physical probability distribution uh, depends upon several parameters that often are unknown. And the purpose of experiments is to, well, a, a purpose of experiments is to collect values of x's such that um, we find out what the thetas are. And um, let me see, I think maybe this is kind of technical. Um, Well, let's see. The first thing is what, um, what is, right. The first thing is what is a, a natural estimator for the mean and it's obviously the sum of the experimental values divided by N. The question though then next is, if you're trying to estimate the variance, what should you use? Should you, should you set it equal to this or something else? And um, what Bessel showed was that, that the naive number, which is just the sum of all the um, uh, variances, or the things that generate the variances divided by n 
is not correct. Instead, let me see, where is the answer? Instead, what you do is um, you don't have one over n, you have one over n, n minus one, or here you would have had n squared, one over n squared. Um, and so this is, the, this is the formula then for the variance um, of the mean, which is one over n times the, um, the variance of sigma squared. Um, and this n here is that n. So what, what Bessel did was to say, you don't estimate the variance by taking the sum of the variances and dividing by n, you divide by n minus one. And then if you want the variance of the mean as opposed to uh, I don't, the variance of the variance, you divide by n. And so this is the experiment, this is the equation that's used um, just universally for um, experiments or measurements of any kind. You add up all the values you got and find and divide by the number of values and you get the average. You then take those values and uh, subtract the mean, square it, sum, and then you divide by n, n minus one and take the square root. And that gives you the standard deviation of, your, of the mean of your distribution. Um, I think I'm going to skip that and go to Kolmogorov's test. Um, this is a um, an interesting, um, quite an interesting result, um, and it, it shows you that probability is more than just you know, figuring out the probability of getting seven if you roll two dice. Um, so suppose you wanna use a sequence of N measurements to determine the probability distribution the measurements come from. And of course, that's what you really want. You want, the probability, knowing the probability distribution means knowing the physics. And, but all you have is you have your experimental values. So how do you get, how do you, how do you tell um, what the probability distribution is? So if we imagine these x's to be continuously, a continuous variable, values of a continuous variable, then we have an experimental probability distribution, if we have n measurements, it's a sum of n delta functions. And uh, that's positive, normalized, it's fine. The cumulative probability distribution is the integral from minus infinity to x of this probability distribution. Um, and so that's this. And if you do that, you just get simply j over n. Um, where uh, here, what we've done here is labeling the, uh, we label the events in increasing order, order of increasing X. So X1, X2, Xn. And in that case, this probability distribution would be J over N if X lies in this window. And um, the next thing you can define is, um, Well, this is the, the real question. Does the, does the empirical probability distribution come from some theoretical cumulative distribution or not? And so this is the hypothesis. This might be some theorist's theory. He would predict, predict these results and you have these results. You take the difference and D sub capital N is the largest value that this assumes on this, on the real line, um, where X, where this cumulative thing is from minus infinity to X. And so what you expect is that as the number of data points increases that the empirical distribution 
in some sense should approach the true distribution. And in this case, this is called the Kolmogorov distance. The Kolmogorov distance should converge to a limiting value for the distance between the true distribution and the hypothetical distribution. So here the idea is take uh, an infinite number or take n measurements, let n go to infinity. And um, what is this Kolmogorov distance? Well, in the limit n going to infinity, it's called d sub infinity. And here's the, here's the bottom line. If the true distribution is the same as the hypothetical distribution, we expect that d infinity should be zero. So this should eventually go to zero because the theory and, and the theory and experiment should roughly coincide. And, um, and in fact, um, that was proven to be true. The real issue though, is how fast the Kolmogorov distance should decrease if our events come from the theoretical distribution or come from the true distribution. And Kolmogorov showed that if the events from the empirical distribution come from the hypothetical distribution, and if that's continuous, then for large n, square root of n d sub n is less than u. So here's Kolmogorov's result that as n goes to infinity, the probability that the square root of n times the Kolmogorov distance is less than u is given by this expression here. Good God, why do I have Gauss's distribution here? Well, maybe there's a reason for that. Actually, I think there is. Um, so here is a here is a PR of U, this thing that I just mentioned, that um, it's a function of U, and as U increases, uh, PR of U goes to one. So let's go back here. So if, on the other hand, if the probability distribution, if, if the empirical distribution comes from a probability distribution that is different from the hypothetical, hypothetical distribution, then as n goes to infinity, we, we expect that this goes to this theoretical distribution. And so dn does not converge to a positive constant. We expect instead that square root of n times the Kolmogorov distance will grow with n as the square root of n times d infinity. In other words, d infinity is not zero. So you express this thing to go as a, um, to diverge as a square root. And of course the square root goes, what? I guess it goes like that. Um, So I did an, an example here um, and well, actually we're out of time. So let me just say I did, uh, the question was to, did, I guess I use Gossett's distribution and a Gaussian. Does Gossett's do the, I, in other words, I was uh, seeing if events from Gossett's could possibly have come from the Gaussian. And um, what, what happens is you, you see they don't. Um, well, I unfortunately used the Gaussian distribution. So I have G for Gauss and also G for Gossett, but S is for student. Okay, well, this, this is actually a, a very important uh, result because um, suppose you're doing an experiment at um, 
some laboratory and you have some theory of what the results should be, then, um, and you have a lot of data points, you compare those data points with the data points predicted by the theory. And then you can use Kolmogorov's test to see is this uh, theory correct or not. And um, that's a, uh, so that's something really important. And um, okay, so I guess that's it. Um, let's see. Um, I think I'm going to do this. I think maybe I'll give one more lecture on the day of the exam. In other words, I've said there's no exam. Okay, instead of an exam, I'll have a lecture. So, um, so I don't know when the exam is supposed to be, but I'll, um, I'll uh, work that out. Um, all right, well, have a nice evening and um, good luck with the final homework assignment. I think it should be, some of it should be amusing. Um, and uh, I think you'll learn something doing the problems. Okay, I'm gonna end the thing now. Uh, stop sharing and...